time when the college has been dealing with so many challenges, we're also seeing the same challenges being faced by community colleges across New York and the country. Enrollment, attention, and completion. Like Suffolk, many colleges are facing these challenges by becoming part of the national movement on student success, which is central to the Achieving a Dream initiative. Nearly every community college in our SUNY system is now engaged in transforming student placement, redesigning developmental coursework, supporting students along a pathway, and strengthening student advising. One of the leaders in this student success work is our keynote speaker, Dr. Randy Van Wagner, the fifth president of Mohawk Valley Community College in Ithaca. I'm sorry, Utica. Make that Utica. Dr. Van Wagner has held this position for the past 12 years. He's a tireless champion of his faculty and speaks to audiences like this one on the courage and climate that facilitate those changes necessary for student success. Please help me to welcome Dr. Van Wagner to the podium. Here. My only uh, previous time on Long Island was for my daughter's uh, soccer tournaments, and it was pretty much to the hotel, the soccer field, some restaurant, and then we were back home. Uh, but driving in, I have to ask, how many, uh, how many of you watched the uh, AMC series Turn, Washington Spies? Yeah? It was the first series that I actually binged on Netflix. Um, a little link to the game on uh, binging. But uh, driving on uh, the expressway and seeing, seeing uh, Setauket so close uh, made me think about uh, that series uh, of the spy ring in the Revolutionary War. And whenever I, I lived in Michigan, uh, Denver, and Omaha, and uh, the last 12 years in Utica, I always think about what that area was like before it was what it is now, uh, reflecting back on, on simpler times and and seeing the transformation occur. And, and when I think of the spy ring, um, you know, spies, when you get information from spies, sometimes it's really clear, um, but there's some risk in how accurate it is. And, and sometimes it's incomplete, and you have to make your own connections with it. And I guess that's what I came to think about in terms of my own remarks here today, uh, when I talk a little bit about the future. Um, some of the information I'll be giving you make, I kind of think of myself as I'm spying on the future. And where I come from that is uh, two things. I co-facilitate uh, the Strategic Horizon Network, which is a group of nine community colleges who bring teams of faculty and staff together twice a year for self-designed programs that we identify to study uh, disruptive innovation, uh, vibrant organizational cultures, and equity outside of higher education. My doctoral advisor at the University of Michigan created, created this with some presidents uh, over 20 years ago. And when he retired four years ago, he kind of, I, I guess I'd been apprenticing with him. So I took over the program. So for example, we will take teams of five to 10 faculty and staff to, um, we've been to places like Ben and Jerry's to look at how they drive their core values deep into their organization in disruptive times. Um, we look at Quicken Loans and how they uh, onboard their, their new employees to really connect to their culture uh, in deep ways. And we'll often hear from speakers that are futurists that talk about the importance of networks uh, and disruptive innovation and what that looks like. So in addition to that, I serve on the uh, Jobs for the Future Policy Trust. And uh, they're talking about uh, what work, the future of work looks like in 2040. And some of those uh, experiences have exposed me to things that have uh, put some ideas in my head that I've tried to consolidate and connect it to uh, organizational culture. My doctoral advisor uh, is co-editing a series on the future of community colleges for ACCT, the Association of Community College Trustees. And he asked me to write a book. and. Uh, and I said, what could it possibly be? And he goes, you need to write a book on culture. And uh, I said, Dick, you hated my writing for my dissertation. Why would I write a book uh, that you edit? And uh, he goes, no, no, the work we've been doing at, the, at MBCC, what I've watched at this college over the years, 
you need to uh, to put some of that in, in, into words. And, and I said, what would what would the title be? He goes, I already have the title. It's called Competing on Culture. Because Oregon's community colleges today, there's so much going on. The, the landscape of higher ed is shifting so much that the community colleges that will thrive in the future know who they are, know what's distinctive about them, and have cultivated and nurtured a, a strong organizational culture uh, that can embrace change and shift with the changing times. So with that, uh, I'll, that's my little prelude to uh, what I want to share with you today. So I appreciate your, uh, the theme, you know, courageous uh, change and guided pathways. Um, and MBCC, to give you a little context, um, we're uh, Utica, not Ithaca, Utica. Um, and uh, about 6,000 students. We were as high as 7,600 students during the peak of the recession. And uh, we're down to 6,000 now. Um, so we've, we've watched uh, the last five years. It's been a rough go. Um, but I think there's a general sense and tenor of how we've managed that um, that has reinforced uh, strong elements of our organizational culture. And uh, so at 6,000 students, yeah, it's much smaller, smaller than I think probably all three of your campuses. But for eight years in Omaha, I was the academic vice president of uh, Metropolitan Community College, uh, about 15,000 students. Uh, we had three campuses, seven unions, uh, four centers, over four counties in the metropolitan area. And I'll mention a little bit about that culture as well, what I learned during my eight years there. So as we think about our culture and our external environment, uh, community colleges are at a real interesting time in our, in our history. Because we're living with paradox. You talk about uh, those resources and, and declines, more and better with less. It's not, we just have to do more with less, it's more and better with less. And that's a real challenge when uh, we have to change, we have to figure out how do we honor the past, what got us here, and how do we create the future. And Jim Collins, the author, uh, business leadership author, he talks about great organizations find a way to preserve the core and stimulate progress. So at times it's things like making cuts, but preserving a professional development debt and not cutting that. I think of professional development as uh, the research and development, the R&D. This is where our, and our research and development is in the thoughts and ideas in this room. So preserving that as part of your core in order to stimulate progress. And as you've probably experienced with your Achieving the Dream work, as we have, uh, we joined Achieving the Dream in 2014, and. Enrollment and graduation don't always line up. When we looked at our data and saw that 76% of students who registered after the first day of class didn't complete, and took a deep breath and said, what if we change our late registration process? What would that look like? That was 80 FTE going out the door. Uh, that was, we were gonna continue to, in the minds of some, uh, professional malpractice, when you're looking at that data, we know students don't have a chance of succeeding. Uh, so we made that change with the support of the Board of Trustees that it was, uh, it was the right thing to do to increase our graduation rate, but it took a hit on enrollment. So that was a really difficult paradox to manage. And my newest one that I've added to this slide is, is what are our offerings, how do we manage our own offerings, and how do we partner? It's not just transfer, it's not just credits in, but how do we partner in the changing landscape of higher education? And it's not just higher education as a landscape that's changing, it's our world. How many of you have heard the, uh, the term VUCA? VUCA, yeah. I first heard it from Meg Wheatley, a, um, wow, that went fast. I swear it once. Tony, can you go back to just the second slide? Heavy on the thumb. Yeah, there we go. So, first heard it from Meg Wheatley, uh, leadership uh, thought leader, 
who uh, mentioned we're living in a VUCA environment. And as I did a little more research to figure out what, where VUCA came from, it actually came from our, our military. Uh, the US military found itself in 2001 uh, throwing its strategic planning ideas out the way, uh, out of the way, because the environment that they were in, uh, in the Middle East and Afghanistan, was uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And traditional planning went out the door. And as you think about our own environment, it's feeling more and more buka like every day. And when you look at those words on the left, it can kind of put you on your heels and you feel a little overwhelmed. But as a culture, if you can find yourself leaning into the words on the right and recast those, that you can approach the future with, with vision, with greater understanding, with clarity, and agility. And if you keep those four words in mind, uh, VUCA can mean something completely different in terms of how you approach the future as an organization. And all of this VUCA world has seemed to be accelerating faster and faster, both in our personal and professional lives. And Tom Friedman, the author of The World is Flat, that many of you may have heard of or read, uh, his recent book, he set out to understand acceleration. So the title of his book, of his latest book, is uh, Thanks for Being Late, An Optimist Guide to the Age of Acceleration. Because when he went to try to understand how and why everything's accelerating, he kept finding a general theme and thread to that. And there's a quick little video of him sharing that. Sounds like such a innocuous year. What's this guy talking about? Well, here's what happened in 2007. He was kicked off at the Moscone Center in San Francisco when one Stephen Jobs unveiled the first iPhone. Uh, beginning a process by which we're now putting into the hands of about half the people on the planet so far a handheld computer that doubles as a camera and a cell phone connected to the internet with more compute power in it than the Apollo space mission. And in 2007, Facebook went global. In 2007, a company called Twitter split off, split off on its own independent platform, and in 2007, went global. In 2007, the most important software you've never heard of, probably, called Hadoop, named after the founder's son's toy elephant, launched into the wild, and Hadoop basically gave the public big data in 2007. 2007, the second most important software you've probably never heard of called GitHub opened its doors. GitHub today has 14 million users. It is the world's largest open source software repository. There isn't a company in this room that is not directly or indirectly drawing today from GitHub's library. Over 2007, it was just clearing its throat. Because in 2007, a company called Google launched its operating system into the wild called Android. And in 2007, the same year, Google bought a little-known TV company called YouTube. In 2007, a guy up in Seattle launched the world's first e-book reader named Jeff Bezos, and it was called the Kindle. Uh, in 2007, IBM launched the world's first cognitive computer called Watson. In 2007, three design students in San Francisco were attending the design conference that year, and they noticed all the hotel rooms were sold out. But one of them had three spare air mattresses in his apartment. They decided to rent those out to people looking for a hotel room. And it worked out so well in 2007, they started a company called Airbnb. In 2007, the internet, actually late 2006, but it was sold in 2007, the internet crossed a billion users, which seems to be something of a tipping point. In 2007, for the first time, we sent more text messages on our phone than voice messages. In 2007, here's a, a little interesting graph. This is a graph of the cost of sequencing uh, uh, a genome. You'll notice in 2001, it's $100 million to sequence a human genome. Um, in 2006, it falls to 10 million. And then it, it just goes over a cliff in uh, 2007. Solar power took off in 2007. In 2007, a process for extracting natural gas from tight shale called fracking exploded. 
between 2006 and 2008, our reserves of natural gas expanded by 35%. Those are our national reserves, basically in the year 2007, because fracking began to scale. This is a picture of social networks, basically. The white line going down, that's the cost of generating a megabit of data. You'll notice it collapses around uh, 2007. Um, the blue line is the speed at which you can transmit that data. That's what Facebook basically looks like. You'll notice the two lines cross in 2008. That's close enough for me. In 2007, the cloud was launched. You'll notice the first year, statistics show up for our 2008. Turns out, 2007 may be understood in time as the single greatest technological inflection point since Google. And we completely missed it because of 2008. So 2007, the new drinking game for nerds. Uh, every time you mention it's 2007, holy cow. Uh, so most of the innovations that you mentioned were platforms. And I think it's safe to say that disruption occurs in platforms, through platforms. And it's important to think about the cycle of disruption. That hopefully comes up on the next slide. Uh, and from a higher education standpoint, I'll, I'll mention that in a moment, but as I think about disruption in every sector, Netflix is a classic case. They had more uh, Blockbuster, in 1999, Blockbuster had more stores than Netflix had subscribers. And in 2001, Netflix, many of you know the story, they went to Blockbuster and asked to be purchased, you know, would you please buy us for $50 million? And Netflix dismissed them. And in 2009, Blockbuster was out of business. Uh, California raised the minimum wage to $15, and McDonald's responded by getting, doing away with their cashiers and creating automated uh, ben, essentially bending foods, if you will. Um, Wall Street Stock Exchange, you think of disruption in the financial, what technology has done to the financial world. And then in the lower left is Too Simple, uh, a autonomous truck driving company uh, in Arizona that last May began running five daily runs between Phoenix and Dallas in partnership with the U.S. Postal Service, running Postal Service runs five times a day um, on the U.S. 40 with autonomous uh, trucks. Yes, the humans behind the wheel, but they're not, there's no need to touch, just for safety. Um, and my work with Jobs for the Future, I've been exposed to conversations about slowing this down because uh, the technology's there but there's no national workforce plan for the 600,000 truck drivers that would be out, out place, uh, or displaced, I should say. So all of these follow a very similar cycle. And if you think about the University of Phoenix, which certainly isn't everyone's favorite example, but when you think back to the 1990s, they were, for those of you who sorry, didn't realize that some people weren't working in the 90s. When I was working in the 90s, <laughs> Um, I to get to that. Um, University of Phoenix was uh, new on the scene. They provided upfront career counseling, uh, promised connections to jobs and employers, intrusive advising, prior learning assessment, and predictable scheduling. And traditional higher education, they, that was their new mousetrap. And traditional higher education, we dismissed University of Phoenix. University of Phoenix suddenly went from online to building buildings and campuses around the country, and then started to bully University of Phoenix, low quality, dismiss plus bullying, and by the early 2000s, they had half a million students enrolled across the country. Granted, through the recession and as new players have come into the marketplace, now they only have about 150,000 students at the University of Phoenix. But think about that model and disruption and displacement, and think of all the new players that are coming onto the higher education scene. 
So as I've looked into disruption a little bit, I came across this image, this graphic on uh, Google Images. They had 10 disruptive models, and they had a private sector model for each one. And I, I said, there, I bet you anything I could come up with one for each of these in higher education. So the freemium model, kind of like Spotify or Pandora, you get the early entry for free, and then you, uh, if you want the full thing, then you, then you have to pay a little more. Well, think about edX and the MOOCs. And edX has followed that model, and yeah, in 2012, our uh, phones were blown up with a new uh, story every day about MOOCs, where massive open online courses are gonna take over the world. And, uh, and then we were able to dismiss them, and they went away. Um, and yet they're still around. Um, and then we, we bullied a little bit to say uh, either quality or it's not scalable, it's irrelevant, it doesn't matter. Well, uh, edX enrolls 14 million people. Doesn't seem irrelevant or off to the side. 14 million people. The free model, they use Facebook. Think of Wikipedia or Google. Wikipedia used to be um, low quality, irrelevant, can't do it, and now it's a little more of a reliable source, but you still probably want to double check, but nonetheless, it's still there. Uh, access versus ownership, they use uh, Zipcar, where you, you don't have to own a car, don't have to go through enterprise, it's a community-based shared resource of uh, renting. So that made me think of book rentals, OERs in that mix as well. Uh, marketplace, um, they, uh, I'm blinking on the, on the private sector marketplace, but nonetheless, Udemy, how many of you have heard of Udemy? Okay. Udemy, oh, oh yeah, the, um, the marketplace, their example is Alibaba, uh, which is uh, based out of China, and it's kind of a combination of Amazon and eBay. It, it's a full, wide open marketplace. And that's kind of what Udemy is. Udemy isn't linked to an institution. It's linked to individual faculty. It's a platform for individual faculty to offer courses. And they have 130,000 courses with 30 million students enrolled. 30 million. The hypermarket, that's where an entity exploits some fallacy or gap in the marketplace and takes advantage of it. So the private sector example they use is Zolando, which is a European uh, clothing retailer that has no inventory, no warehouses, very little overhead, and super low prices for great clothes. Because they work, they, they place, they establish a network of uh, clothing providers, and they don't place an order until they get an order from a customer. So they're this intermediate area. Uh, and that made me think of straighterline.com. You can go back on straighterline.com. Okay. Straighterline.com is growing about 25,000 students a year. They're a little over 100,000 students a year. And their business model that they came out with in 2015-16 is uh, calling out the fallacy, as they see it, in uh, higher education. Uh, that what if we take the top 50 most transferable courses partner with accredited institutions and provide the platform for them to offer those classes online at a discounted rate. I came across this uh, during the Strategic Horizon Network, one of our colloquia had um, Peter Smith as one of our speakers who wrote uh, a book called Free Range Learning and talked about straighterline.com. So I did a little investigation, go to straighterline.com and the day that I clicked on that, my educator's heart just kind of grew a little darker that day because um, Psychology 101, Intro to Psychology, was on sale for $79 for three credits. Um, and this week, there was another time I went on the website and it got even worse because this week only, English Comp 1 was on sale for $7.99. Oh, that doesn't even feel right, right? Oh. However, they partnered with those 135 colleges and universities, and they're accredited or recognized by uh, the American Council of Education, just like East Dante's. 
And in 2017, their students reported successfully transferring courses from the straighterline.com platform to over 2,000 colleges and universities across America. So go back to that paradox of your offerings and partnering. Where do you partner? Do you go into the cycle of disruption and dismiss straighterline.com and the quality because when you went on to uh, Northeast Union Technical wherever that you've never heard of and you dismiss the other 134 colleges? So straighterline.com, you don't accept anything from straighterline.com? Or do you go through, you do the due diligence, and you go through straighterline.com and yeah, Northeast Technical, whatever the weather looks like a Sally Struthers, you know, correspondence course. But if a student takes English composition through straighterline.com and has a transcript from SUNY Empire State, do you take it? From Paul Smith College, do you take it? Bellevue University? Maybe you just identify the five colleges that work for Suffolk on straighterline.com and you accept those. Uh, where do you partner and where do you offer in this environment? Uh, experience is another disruption model. Uh, they use Tesla as the experience. You get to drive an uh, environmentally friendly sports car. Cool. Uh, I put coding academies here because where else could you walk through the door regardless of your degree and they're going to teach you how to code uh, and go into a, a, a well-paying job um, that's easy to get with that right credential. And again, disruption model five years ago, a uh, flat iron school in New York City, dismissive, they're kind of a, they have federally approved financial aid from the U.S. Department of Education. Um, those coding academies are coming from everywhere. Uh, a few months ago, I wrestled with the pyramid because the private sector had, they had Amazon in this model. And I put a question mark. I'm sure someday there will be somebody who comes up with a pyramid uh, model to disrupt higher education. And about a month and a half ago, Amazon came out and said they're so frustrated with higher education that they're going to commit to training and educating a third of their workforce in-house because they're done with us. So now I have Amazon as both a private and higher education disruptor. And once education, Amazon's in your sector, you know, buckle up. <laughs> uh, on demand, they use my chest. Craig just talking about this. Many times I hear this talk. Um, on demand, I think of uh, their example is Uber. I want to go somewhere. I got my app. I'll call Uber and I go. Uh, with uh, daughters of 18 and 22 years old, the last couple of um, years, I put YouTube here because, well, I don't know about you, but their the confidence they have in I try to parent and give them this good information in my perspective. And they're like, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to go on YouTube and say, how do I? And watch a three minute video. Uh, so YouTube is on the the ecosystem, uh, uh, that, that, that model has integrated products. When you think of Apple, um, you know, you buy their iPhone and they don't have a, a jack for the, uh, for the earphones, so you've got to buy like, their pods, their pods, whatever. Their products interlink with one another. And again, as recently as maybe 10 months ago, I was wrestling with what is that model? Uh, who's doing the integrated product line? within higher education and uh, came across LinkedIn and what LinkedIn's up to. Uh, think about LinkedIn and what do you do with LinkedIn? You put your, uh, your profile, your background, uh, your education, your work, uh, and what if they have access to all of that big data and say, you know, people just like you uh, took courses and got credentials at this point in their career. Uh, why don't you go to one of our products, one of our partners, uh, and take classes from them? Uh, so in the last 12 months, and who owns LinkedIn? Microsoft. And Microsoft owns, I think it, I'm trying to keep up with it, Microsoft owns, um, they just changed the name of it, but Linda, Linda.com, which is a free, or 
low-cost um, skill development training site. Um, so Microsoft owns, owns that and LinkedIn. And now Microsoft is a major player in the edX platform. Uh, so you see how they're connecting those dots to advance their work. And then finally, the subscription model. Um, if any of you subscribe to HelloFresh or Blue Apron, it gives you, you can order the, all of the ingredients and the meals and get your own chopped model going in your own kitchen. It's a subscription model uh, to disrupt the grocery stores and the restaurants kind of thing. Uh, well, just as edX hasn't gone away, Coursera, one of the original MOOCs, has not gone away either. So for four, between 40, you pay a, a monthly membership and, and between 40 and $90, whatever your uh, learning bundle would be, whether if you want to learn data analytics or um, uh, positive, get a certificate from uh, University of Washington in positive psychology, um, you, can, you can go on Coursera and go through all the content you want because of your subscription to their content. And if you wonder how that model is working, there are 30 million people taking classes on the Coursera platform. So as much as I want to complain about demographics and the unemployment rate and uh, four-year colleges lowering, lowering their standards, admission standards, and taking enrollments away from us, all of these models, I believe, are chipping away at our enrollment. We might not be losing hundreds and tens of thousands or whatever, but 10, 10 20, 30 in some of these models, finding, it, finding their learning elsewhere, um, it chips away at the enrollment. So trying to figure out how to integrate all of these other uh, aspects to the higher education landscape into our world, um, instead of following that traditional disruption model of dismissing and bullying, um, versus doing the real work to go in and figure out what makes sense for your college, for how much you can bring in, and where do you find it, and what do you preserve in your own offerings. And it goes to the individualized student experience uh, to understand what the individual student needs and what's right for them. And it's only gonna, as much as Tom Friedman talks about 2007, um, it's only gonna get faster and more intense in the next 10 years. Hit it. What is 45,689 divided by 67? Sure. He silently asks the computer and then hears the answer through vibrations transmitted through his skull and into his inner ear. Six, eight, one, point nine, two, five. Exactly right. One more. What's the largest city in Bulgaria, and what is the population? The screen shows how long it takes the computer to read the words that he's saying to himself. Sophia, 1.21 1 million. <laughs> that is correct. You just Googled that. I did. You could be an expert in any subject. Mm -hmm. You have the entire internet in your head. That's the idea. tragic events and those things where you remember exactly where you were when, when I first saw that, because holy moly. Uh, the MIT Media Lab operates for students who, grad students, they take about 20 grad students a year, um, who in order to get in you have to have an idea that's going to change the world and then you basically get a blank check to do research. Uh, I, when I saw that, I instantly said, man, I have to take the Strategic Horizon Network to the MIT Media Lab. Uh, so activate the network and try to get in. I actually talked to somebody, a director inside the lab, and I said, I want to bring um, uh, 80 people from these community colleges in, into the lab for a tour. And they said, oh, we used to do tours, but um, we a long time ago, but now we're a membership organization. And I said, oh, we're, we're a membership organization too. We, we've got a little kitty of fun balance. What's your annual membership? Uh, 
$500,000. Oh my God, who are your members? I should have known. Amazon, Google, Apple. Yeah, because they get early access to their intellectual property that comes out of the MIT Media Lab. Um, so, and they usually have had about a, a 15 to 20 year to market with many of their larger uh, inventions like uh, adapting the military work with um, GPS. And they called it turn-by-turn -turn navigation back in the 80s. Uh, they invented swipe screen technology. Uh, they just didn't get the patent on it because they didn't think anybody would ever figure out what to do with all the fingerprints on the screen. So they missed that one. Uh, but yeah, so that's there. When I think of, of the implications of that, um, yeah, you can get the information, but yeah, there is the critical thinking and all that goes with that, but even a level deeper for me uh, goes to what are the implications with that device, with that kind of technology for equity, the haves and have-nots. What if you can't afford that device? What's your life going to be like? Where are you going to go? Uh, and how are you going to compete with someone who can afford it? That notion of equity, we're really wrestling with that conversation on our campus uh, in a county that carried President Trump quite uh, significantly. Um, the conversations around equity are difficult. When we talk about every student getting what they need versus every student getting the same thing, you have conversations with people saying, yeah, they all, they all pay the same price, they should get the same thing. Uh, otherwise, you're taking resources from one student to another. Whew. Having a deeper conversation about uh, the reality. That's why I like this slide so much. The reality of the finish line is the same, graduation and a good job, and a good career. But the starting line is very different when you look at uh, certain populations that you serve uh, at your college and what they've had to overcome just to get to your front door. And that speaks to social mobility, which is certainly stalled in this country. Um, Raz Chetty's data and research on the Opportunity Atlas, you can go to the Opportunity Atlas, uh, and it's an interactive map and uh, by census tract, and you can look at the household income uh, by census tract. So I know you probably know some of the places I'm blanking on some of the names, but I know there are at least three census tracts in Suffolk County where the average household income is about $23,000. Um, that feels like a pretty heavy lift uh, in the New York City Metro. Uh, and David Dodson from the MDC organization in, in North Carolina does some great work around um, birthplace as destiny where he uses the opportunity atlas, atlas to talk about the odds of individuals born in certain zip codes uh, and the likelihood that they will advance out of the lower two quintiles uh, on the socioeconomic status. It is extremely low. Uh, the stickiness of poverty. Uh, we have the widening income gap uh, in America at the, its greatest point uh, since the pre-depression in the 1929. And yet countless research studies show education really is the catalyst for upward social mobility. Uh, and as we look at the job we're doing as a higher education sector, we have 7 uh, million job openings and 6 million unemployed across the country. And you wonder why Amazon throws its hands up in the air on higher education and says we're going to do it ourselves. Because we're missing, we're missing it somehow. And it's not just us. It's all, there's a society element to everybody has to go get a bachelor's degree. And yet only 35% of Americans, American adults do. So as we wrestled with uh, higher education, or, or with our enrollment, I should say, um, I stood at fall opening for our faculty and staff and I should say, there's in a, a screen I'm showing you that my own faculty and staff haven't seen. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm not escaping to go talk about stuff. I wanna, I'm sharing it with, with my folks as well. Um, in our little county of 235,000 people in Oneida County, uh, we have 30,000 adults over 25 with some college and no credential. And it's all we can do to offer evening cohort classes. Um, we can offer classes in the evening. But 
they need, their lives are so busy, they need, uh, we copied CUCA's ASAP program. Um, so we have CUCA on our campus, where if you come in with junior standing, they take our associate degree, and you go one, uh, one night a week, year round for two years, and you, it's hybrid as well, and you get your bachelor's degree. And by having them on our campus, our faculty said, hey, what if, uh, what if we offer an associate's degree on that Tuesday night um, so that they could have four years of the same night every year? And the graduation rate in those programs are double what our college-wide graduation rate is. So, trying to find new ways, looking at other models and adapting them to make them our own. So, uh, with that, that in mind, uh, that notion of time for change, um, I, I, first thing that came to mind is changing for those returning adults and changing for first generation college students. I'm a first generation college student myself and that's why I've always worked in community colleges, um, because what it did for me and what it meant to me. Uh, but as we get further into our work with achieving the dream and guided pathways, people are starting to pay attention and listen more closely. We had a faculty member uh, share a story with me um, from uh, the day before classes. We did a, a new student convocation and met with the faculty advisors and uh, the criminal justice faculty pulled all the criminal justice majors in the room and they were going through their stuff and uh, the one faculty member said, I, we're, we're not paying attention the way we need to because when we opened it up to questions, the student raised his hand and said, so uh, classes start on Wednesday, um, where do I report on Thursday? We said, what, where do you report? What do you mean, where do you report? Well, in high school, we went to class every day, uh, and I don't have class on Thursday, so what, do, what, what am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. And he said, it just caught me flat-footed, and the other CJ faculty next to him said, and the scariest thing were the five students behind them nodding their head because they had the same question. And we were just trying to calibrate how, how did you get through high school and no one told you that how, let alone our intake process, that no one talked about how different college is from high school. Think of just the assumptions that it's that basic to break it down. Uh, I do a, a new employee meeting with some, uh, with all of our full-time employees after they've been on the job for a couple of months because we only have 400 employees, full-time employees. Um, why I chose this size college as a president so I could do these kind of things and work on culture and know everybody. So as I'm talking to uh, uh, an employee who worked at our uh, enrollment help desk, the first intake space, I said, what's been your biggest surprise? You didn't work at a community college. What's been your biggest surprise? He said, the anxiety that students come to this front desk with. Um, I met one student just last week. He said, this was, this story's like three years old, but it's so powerful. He said, the student came in and said, this is my third time into college. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the first time, I couldn't get off the bus. I was too nervous. I didn't belong. It's not my place. The second time I got off the bus, I made it to the door and couldn't, I couldn't open it. I froze up. I got back on the bus and went home. This is my third time standing here. I, I made it through the door to the door. The guy was shaking like a leaf. And he was like six. He was a house. He was big. But... Uh, didn't think he belonged on that campus. So having those kinds of, knowing those stories are out there and thinking about how we need to change and begging our, the question. For us, I, I looked at the college scorecard.gov and looked at your three-year graduation rate and plus or minus, who knows what data was submitted, but it said Suffolk Community College graduation rate 25%. Through Achieving the Dream, when we did our first college-wide data summit, it was 23%. And, uh, at MVCC, and that was the first time we started talking about our overall performance numbers. And, and instead of dismissing them for all the shortcomings and the narrow features of that stat, at the end of the day, for those students who met those criteria, we can do better. Um, so how do we do better? And we've been tweaking around the edges for years, and that was also a little tipping point for us, was as we looked at guided pathways, it, more and more it, it felt like a magnet of all these student success initiatives that we were all busting our tails trying to do better for our students, but we were, half the time we were working at cross purposes. Nothing was aligned, it was all tweaking at the edges. There was no guiding framework to do this large scale student 
completion change, <coughs> success change. And the logos on the screen you see uh, really the Community College Resource Center uh, at the Teachers College of Columbia leading this work with their 2015 book, uh, Redesigning America's Community Colleges. Um, work actually began with them uh, and AACC and Jobs for the Future way back in 2003 and four when Achieving the Dream was founded uh, and created. That was then followed by the Completion by Design work in 2011, and then the Guided Pathways 2015, 2015 that's been um, accelerating the work. Now with, I believe it's close to 400 community colleges engaged in the Guided Pathways framework. And CCRC has come up with, uh, you may have seen these, the Guided Pathways Essential Practices uh, with the four pillars, which is actually the logo for the day. Um, to clarify the path, and, and that really, uh, that the work of curriculum mapping, uh, I think that has been a powerful exercise for our faculty to really have the hard conversations about hidden prerequisites that, despite the best intentions to create cohesive programs of study, wow, we trip over ourselves by not seeing things through the student lens and really taking uh, inventory of where we can trip students up uh, unintentionally. Front loading the career and transfer information on the front end versus finding your way, and the back end will help you with that next step. I openly state our, our career services, we did not, we were almost doing career services as a hobby um, on the back end with one or two folks just trying to do their, their level best versus front-loading career services with, um, as part of our intake and onboarding process to help students get on a path sooner. Uh, staying on a path, intrusive advising. Uh, yeah, so gosh, University of Phoenix, upfront career advice, intrusive advising, um, coordinated scheduling, um, prior learning assessments, all of that falls into essential practices of guided pathways. And then in ensuring learning, uh, active learning, that's, it, it's interesting that we, MBCC, we were part of the American Association of Community Colleges Guided Pathways 2.0 cohort, and we just went to our final institute two weeks ago, and much like achieving the dream, uh, not casting stones because this is hard work, but I do find it interesting that um, achieving the dream had been around for about 10, 12 years, and they came up with their capacity framework, and they added teaching and learning, like after 10 years of work, and we just went to the Guided Pathways Institute, and they're all excited about this ensure learning uh, pillar, uh, because they're coming around to saying we've got to really have some deeper conversations about what teaching and learning looks like in the Guided Pathways framework where before it was easy to kind of dismiss Guided Pathways as this thing that the rest of the institution just need to get its act together, versus what does an equity-minded syllabus look like? Our work with Guided Pathways has prompted us to have faculty look at, uh, by having student panels in front of faculty and uh, telling their stories, and faculty in tears saying, I had three of those six students in my class and I didn't know their story because I never asked. So now in my syllabus, or not in my syllabus, but on the first day of all my classes, I say, on this piece of paper, just tell me if there's something that I should know about you that may impact your success, that you want me to know about. Fold it up and give it to me. And it has made all the difference. All of a sudden now, in fact, we are getting these um, incredible life issues that students have that they might not tell otherwise or should share otherwise. And we built resources of holistic support with our College Community Connection Program for students to be able to have access to a pantry. Um, our community resource specialist will help them sort through their um, benefits at the Department of Social Services because we've got a bat phone um, for her to contact the social worker so the student doesn't have to choose between waiting four, four hours in line in DSS for going to class. They can just go to class and when they come back, uh, the resource specialist has sorted that out for them. And then uh, the uh, Rob Johnstone, has Rob Johnstone spoke, spoken here? I think, no. He will come this spring. 
It would be like out of 1,100 community colleges, you're probably up in the four to 500, but he, he travels like 100 days out of the year. He's been to our campus, he's amazing. And his uh, National Center for uh, Inquiry and Innovation, um, he put together these 10, 10 myths about guided pathways, and I think they're important to just briefly address. He will go much deeper and do it much better than I, so I'll just, this will be a wash, rinse, repeat. You'll get this here, and then you'll get it again in the spring at a much uh, more meaningful level. But he talks about um, don't guided pathways, uh, isn't the guided pathways framework uh, going against uh, meritoc meritocracy? Instead of trying to help all students, the ones who, who deserve it or work hard, they should get it. Well, uh, it doesn't play out in the data with a, a New York Times article a few years back that showed um, students in the, in the highest quintile who, who had test scores below national average graduated uh, college at a 30% rate, and uh, students with test scores, rich students with test scores above the national average graduated at a 70% graduation rate, and students in the lowest quartile with uh, test scores above, or I'm sorry, yeah, above the, the national mean. So smart, poor kids were graduating at 26%. They were graduating college at the same rate that the unprepared, you know, the lower scoring originally <coughs> were. So that just shows you the stickiness of poverty and what they have to overcome and the role that uh, uh, socioeconomic status plays in student success. Uh, free choice, uh, guided pathway is going to narrow the choices for students and higher ed is all about free choice. Um, that, that may be true, but um, if you go to a dinner menu um, with five pages of choices, too much choice is no choice. And, uh, and that's as a first generation college student, that's what, what that looks like. Uh, quality, doesn't it take away quality of, of higher education? And I think that's a to go down in terms of how do we define quality, um, that, that would take up the rest of the day. Um, but the heart of liberal arts, I think, is an important one. Um, I think in the guided pathways, there's a part of many of us in higher education that just sees this trend toward higher education. It's, just, it's all about the J-O-B, just driving everybody to the job and the workplace and the employers are having too much voice in things. Uh, but we've been talking at NBCC about kind of like Buka. Reframe it because what do employers want? Employers want uh, critical thinking and problem solving. And what do liberal arts do? Critical thinking and problem solving. So if you can really connect those two dots, I think it's the time for liberal arts. It's an ex it could be an exciting time for liberal arts, depending on how you frame frame this work in guided pathways. Uh, and and with the liberal arts uh, arranging uh, a general education path or a set of gen, gen ed requirements by program, what's the default? Um, again, not every student's going to need that. Some students may want their own path, but by just having a default in place, having those faculty conversations about what's the best set of gen ed electives in the liberal art domains uh, for this program, um, those are really rich conversations and, and can put um, faculty in control of the conversation for what goes. It's just within the framework not specified, but faculty can, can shape those conversations, and that's where the, the faculty control comes in, as well as the curriculum mapping exercises, um, to really have the faculty dialogue to revisit the, the curricula in, in new and different ways. Um, what about the enrollment swirl? Um, you know, we're going to lose enrollment in guided pathways. I don't know if through your achieving the dream work, we did the same thing we did, but we, we ran degree audits on students who were already enrolled with more than 60 credits. And this was a few years back, and we found 225 students who had graduated with their general studies degree enrolled in classes at MBCC. Again, that just felt like professional malpractice. We just kind of let them take in their tuition and they'd already graduated. Um, so yeah, we took a hit in our enrollment there, but um, what we're banking on when we get this right and get it to scale, um, the enrollment return on, through retention. Um, when we're losing 40% uh, fall to fall, uh, we would see enrollment, we intend to see enrollment gains through retention. 
And then uh, all the hand-holding, um, the real world. Um, I think when you hear those student stories, uh, let's talk about the real world in terms of 50% um, community college students um, food insecure and 15% uh, homeless or 30% housing insecure. Um, there, uh, as Russell Lowry Hart at Amarillo College says, uh, his phrase is, I spend, uh, uh, some of our students spend a nickel like it's, um, uh, spend $500 like it's a nickel, and I spend a nickel like it's $500, uh, or vice versa. Nonetheless, how they deal with their money, um, they're living in the real world, no matter how much we want to say they're not. Career choices at 18 and career changes, um, these kind of go together. And the work in, in Guided Pathways and the curriculum mapping, what we've seen is our faculty having a conversation about the, um, the first semester and, and sorting it through so that no matter what you hear in business, you can still be on path with no matter which way you go, because they take all the same classes in the first semester while they sort it out. Same with art and engineering. That first semester, having a common first semester keeps students on path. Um, and that's a very efficient way uh, to help them make a more informed career choice. Deb, if I could do a time check. My, where do I go? Okay. The, um, I'm gonna, uh, you've got your pillars, I'll go there. I wanna do this real quick. So through all that, uh, I think it's important to keep calm and stay relevant. Rick Warren has a, uh, He's a pastor of Saddleback Church, great TED Talk on uh, remaining relevant. And he says if change is happening outside your organization faster than it is inside your organization, uh, your organization runs the risk of becoming irrelevant. And I'd adapt that one step further. If your organization is changing faster than you are, then you run the risk of becoming irrelevant. Uh, because courageous change is, is indeed hard. And uh, in that same TED Talk, he he talks about the emotions of change. And he says, Rick Warren says that there is no growth without change, no change without pain, no pain without loss, and no loss without grief. The people who are resisting change, they just, you know, some people, they're gonna resist any change, no matter what it is. But a vast majority of people are probably resisting change, at least initially, from the fact that they're dealing, they're grieving, grieving with the change in the sense of loss. And I think that, that goes to being patient with each other and patient with yourself as you move through change. And I found this graphic of uh, the cycle of change on Google Images. And uh, as I looked at it, I thought, wow, think of the emotions of change. And I overlaid the five stages of grief on it. And it kind of follows the same, the same pattern. As you go through, through change, I think it's important to think about the pace of change. Uh, the, my apologies to the biologists in the room, but the punctuated equilibrium model from biology, Tushman and Romanelli adapted that for organizational change, and the idea that organizations move through periods of equilibrium, um, and it's kind of homeostasis, if you will, little change, and punctuation. So if you have too much, too long of a period of equilibrium, and you have even a small change, it can be this huge punctuation that feels like a lot of change. But if you're changing and embracing change and changing in good ways on a regular basis, the punctuations are less. You have shorter periods of equilibrium to catch your breath so you don't you know, get fatigued. But uh, it's kind of like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger you get. So I'll talk about, more about culture in my breakout. Um, the things I learned in doing my research for uh, my book, Competing on Culture. Um, but I think it's important to notice that we all co-create culture. And that I'll talk more about this notion that uh, culture is like an iceberg. You only you can see just a little bit above the surface, but there's a lot of deep stuff about how things are done around here, how we treat each other, um, and what are the ways that uh, the previous slide said a bunch of subcultures. Um, subcultures don't equal an overarching culture. Um, so, what does your overarching culture look like? And I'll go to these last two slides. Talk building blocks for culture, next session. Leverage to accelerate change, uh, leadership development at all levels.
governance, we'll have a lot of conversation in the breakout about that, about how guided pathways and governance uh, connect to one another. This is hard work, so thinking through, it's great to see recognition. Um, what are your, what does your system of recognition look like in big ways, little ways, uh, group and individual? Um, data and inquiry, your work with uh, achieving the dream, critical, and then uh, communication is um, it's like a whole other day working on communication, no matter how big or small your organization is. And then the, the last thing is uh, this model. Um, this is some of the things we're talking about at Jobs for the Future. Um, this is my stuff, uh, not officially JFF, but it, it's inspired by conversations at, at JFF um, about the future. Fast forward to 2030, you know, right now, half of all millennials are on a 1099 independent contractor, and they project by 2030, half of all workers will be on a 1099. Um, 32% of all workers changed jobs in the last two years. So there's, this, there's a lot of movement in the workplace. Um, and what is our role? Um, the fastest growing entrepreneurship and small business are called solopreneurs, people who are literally incorporating themselves to sell their skills. So they're gonna constantly be upgrading those skills, going back and forth between work and upskilling their, their skill set. How well positioned is Suffolk to be able to manage that? with all of those platforms, and when you think of a first-generation college student, how do they sort through all of those choices going back to the disruption model? But if you can find a way to, I, I use the term premier partner, if you will, identify and sort through which MOOC do they go, and is it right for them, and what does your prior learning assessment system look like? If you can get those things down, you're gonna be able to be that sense maker for, for those students of the future and have those holistic supports and not just uh, be student-centered, but be individual-centered. To really see the student as a person with holistic needs. And we've tried to do that at MBCC, and uh, a few years ago I wrote a, I'd like to think it was a poem, but uh, I called it Ode to the Community College Student, to speak to and give voice to all the different types of community college students that I've experienced over the years and the one that I identified with the most um, that uh, can just about move me to tears. I took it to the marketing department, said I want to do something with this, but I'm not sure, and they go, oh, let's, let's take care of it, because I wanted to give a handout at our new employee orientation, and, um, and they came back with a video that I'd like to close with. Community colleges are a uniquely American invention. The typical community college student defies definition as they seek unmatched support to adhere to the required academic rigor and succeed. Regardless of their profile and background, community college students need every bit of everything we have to offer, no matter our position or job. Here is our challenge, here is our inspiration, here is our call. I am the art student who prefers small classes, the first of my family to attend college, breaking the intergenerational cycle of poverty. I hope I find it in you. I am the adult student who has no time. My child is sick. My job is mindless. I have dreams for myself, and I have bigger dreams for my children, so I am out of the way. I hope I find it in you. I am the student with the unseen discipline. Putting in extra hours every day, determined to not let anything stop. I overcome challenges every day. Others will never know. I hope to find a new me. I am a student of the green. I've made choices in my life, more bad than good. The consequences are more than I expected. I hope this will be the time to make the change in the game. I'm the other student. Going through the motions of waiting for a spark. I don't know my strengths and my dreams are small. My potential is beyond anything I can imagine. I hope I find it. I don't even know what I don't know. All I do know is I just need something. I just need a strong shoulder, helping hand, warm heart, or a caring ear. But most of all, I just need a chance. I hope I find it. 
So I hope I gave you some things to think about today as you go about your work in this courageous work on guided pathways in your student success, scaling student success for Suffolk Community College. You're the largest one in our system, uh, so we'll all be watching you at scale. Uh, so thank you.